தி யூக்கரிஸ்ட் அண்ட் செயின்ட் பீட்டர் ஜூலியன் எய்மார்ட் பர்னார்ட் கமீர் எஸ் 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 கண்டென்ட்ஸ் ஒன் ஹிஸ் லைஃப் விஷன் அண்ட் மிஷன் டூ கிஃப்ட் ஆஃப் கிரைஸ்ட் சாக்ரிஃபைஸ் த்ரீ சேக்ரமெண்ட் ஆஃப் த சர்ச் க்ரோத் அண்ட் யூனிட்டி ஃபோர் ரெவலேஷன் ஆஃப் கிரைஸ்ட் லவ் ஃபைவ் கிரைஸ்ட் ப்ரசன்ஸ் அமாங் அஸ் சிக்ஸ் ஆர் கால் டு லவ் செவன் அடுரேஷன் ஆர் டைம் அப்பார்ட் வித் கிரைஸ்ட் எயிட் ஆர் கால் டு சர்வ் நைன் தி மெரியன் டைமென்ஷன் டென் அப்பாசல் ஆஃப் த யூக்கரிஸ்ட் இன்ட்ரடக்ஷன் த ரீடர் ஆஃப் தீஸ் ஷார்ட் ரிஃப்ளெக்ஷன்ஸ் ஆன் தி யூக்கரிஸ்ட் அண்ட் செயின்ட் பீட்டர் ஜூலியன் எய்மார் will discover a wealth of material for one's prayer life although these 10 meditations are brief they nonetheless will take the reader a long way towards a deeper appreciation of the eucharist not only in the life of saint peter julian aimod but also in one's own spiritual journey as one meditates on the profound influence the holy eucharist has had in the life of saint peter julian aimod and how this sacramental mystery of our faith shaped his life and mission the grace of the eucharist will undoubtedly touch your life as well may whoever uses these prayerful meditations be inspired like saint peter julian aimard to live a more focused eucharistic life may the apostle of the eucharist guide the reader to a clearer vision of the depth of god's love in this sacrament and to deeper appreciation of the power of the eucharist to transform our lives very reverend naman b pelletier provincial superior congregation of the blessed sacrament province of saint anne usa february 4th 2011 200th anniversary of the birth of saint peter julian in lamure france it was my great pleasure to preach the annual novena in honor of saint peter julian aimod at the blessed sacrament fathers shrine in liverpool england from july 24th to august 2nd of 2009 in response to the pro- prompting of several of my fellow religious i am pleased to share with the wider audience the content of the 10 sermons preached during the novena and on the feast of saint peter julian these reflections on the eucharist and saint aimod were preached to a specific congregation but required only minor editing to communicate their message to a broader catholic audience bernard j kamir s s s his life vision and mission the church and saint peter julian aimard with the recent economic meltdown that has occurred in just about every part of the world a great many people have become very preoccupied and nervous about wealth that is the wealth large or small that they presently have or that they have been hoping to have a couple of years ago our holy father pope benedict brought up the topic of wealth the occasion however was not an economic crisis a concern about material wealth the the occasion rather was his putting together a wonderful summary of the 11th ordinary general assembly of the synod of bishops that considered in depth the sacrament of the eucharist in his masterful summary the apostolic exhortation entitled sacramentum caritatis sacrament of charity pope benedict states in the most blessed eucharist is contained the entire spiritual wealth of the church we probably read that quote or heard it somewhere a couple of years ago but did not really catch the weight of those words in the most blessed eucharist is 
contain the entire spiritual wealth of the church i should like to explore here some of that spiritual wealth that we catholic christians possess in the holy eucharist in addition i should like to explore another secondary store of spiritual wealth of the catholic church namely the life example and teachings of the church saints on august 2nd of every year the blessed sacrament fathers and brothers celebrate the feast day of their founder saint peter julian aymard a saint who has been given the title apostle of the eucharist the title has been justly bestowed i believe because if we have any acquaintance with the saint to say his name or to think of him is to bring to mind the eucharist so intimately is his person associated with this sacrament in these passages i should like to offer some reflections on the eucharist and how that sacrament encompassed the life of saint peter julian aymard how it influenced and found expression in the phases of his life the undertakings of his priestly zeal and the valued teachings that he handed on to us it would be helpful i think to begin with a brief overview of his life and mission peter julian aymard was born on the 4th of february 1811 in the town of lamure in the diocese of grenoble situated in the french alps after having to deal with his father's residence to his pursuit of a priestly vocation as well as with certain health problems he eventually entered the diocese seminary of grenoble and in 1834 was ordained to the priesthood after some years as a diocesan priest he felt drawn to the religious life and entered a newly formed congregation the modest fathers in lyons in a surprisingly short time and i think it is a testimony to his intellectual and spiritual competence he was entrusted with various important responsibilities in that congregation however there was something continually striving within his heart and soul he experienced an ever growing attraction to the eucharist and a desire to do something exceptional for that central of sacraments in the life of the church this powerful attraction reached a significant point one day in january of 1851 as he was praying in the marian sanctuary of fauviere in lyons as he prayed he was profoundly moved by the lack of spiritual formation among many catholics and especially by a lack of true understanding and appreciation of the sacrament of the eucharist in christian life this lack manifested itself in attitudes of indifference towards the sacrament and worst still in acts of sacrilege it was as a result of this spiritual experience at fauviere that he decided to form a third order of men dedicated to repertory adoration of the blessed sacrament but this initial idea gradually took on a different shape over the next several years and finally became a definitive objective namely to establish not a third order but a religious congregation dedicated to the worship and apostolate of the eucharist when it became clear to saint aymard that the congregation he had in mind had to be a distinct entity from the marist fathers he asked for a dispensation from his vows as a marist and when that was obtained he went to paris where on the 13th of may 1856 he founded the congregation of the blessed sacrament the congregation consisting of only a few members and situated in a small chapel on rue du brie received the 
அப்ரோபேஷன் ஆஃப் த ஆர்ச் பிஷப் ஆஃப் பாரிஸ் மாரி டாமினிக்கி சிபோ and later the blessing and definitive abrogation of pope pius 9th in 1863 one of the happiest days in the life of father aymar was the day the feast of the epiphany 1857 when the congregation was officially inaugurated with solemn exposition of the blessed sacrament over the next 12 years four fourth foundations were established three in france and one in belgium before his death at the young age of 57 father aymard managed to fill his days with an incredible amount of ministry sacramental administration catechetical instruction preaching engagements writing spiritual direction etc in all of this he revealed his passion for the eucharist his burning desire to see the eucharist imbue christian life and influence society in what follows i shall share some further facts of saint peter julian's life and his teaching on the sacrament of the eucharist both of which reveal his profound understanding of the eucharist place in authentic christian life and his personal love of the eucharistic christ my hope in doing this is that you will continue to grow in your understanding of the eucharist and allow its riches its wealth to enter more deeply into the texture of your daily catholic christian life gift of christ sacrifice the eucharist and saint peter julian a mod in the average catholic were to be asked what picture do you form in your mind when you hear the word eucharist the answer given would undoubtedly reveal the many aspects of the sacrament for example the image that might come to mind is of the priest bending slightly over the host and chalice on the altar and saying this is my body given up for you this is the cup of my blood shed for you then again perhaps the image is that of a line of people coming up to the priest celebrant and receiving the consecrated host with a faith affirming amen or else the image is that of a monstrance or tabernacle containing the sacramental body of christ and before which people are praying quietly these are of course only a sampling of the many possible images of the eucharist that might come to mind and that reveal some truth or aspect of the eucharistic mystery the fact is the eucharist is a sacrament of many spiritual splendors we begin with that first example of an image that the word eucharist might bring to mind that of the priest at the moment of consecration saying this is my body given for you this is the cup of my blood shed for you what is the eucharistic truth that underlines the moment of consecration as we all know jesus instituted the eucharist at the last supper that supper was a ritual meal commemorating a central event in the history of the jewish people their deliverance from slavery in egypt when the jews people ate that ritual meal at passover they not only recalled a past event but also a prophetic promise of a deliverance yet to come a deliverance that would be more profound universal and definitive this then is the context in which jesus introduces the gift of the eucharist in the course of the ritual meal he takes unleavened bread from the table and saying over it this is my body which will be given up for you later he raises a cup of wine and says over it this is my blood the blood of the new covenant which will be shed for you 
do this in memory of me with those momentous words jesus reveals himself as the true sacrificial lamb who takes away the sins of the world when jesus speaks of his body given for you and his blood shed for you he is showing that his death on the cross is a saving event for all human kind an event that profoundly alters and renews the spiritual history of human beings so then what takes place when we do what jesus told us to do in his memory that is when we celebrate the eucharist what happens is that the saying life giving death of jesus on the cross that is his perfect self giving to the father for our sake enters into a particular moment in history and makes contact with our lives here and now and that sacrifice of jesus is given to us sacramentally so that we might enter into jesus self offering so that we might be one with him in his act of love and praise of god the father in the holy spirit as pope benedict 16th said in his very first encyclical the eucharist draws us into jesus act of self ablation we enter into the very dynamic of his self giving if this is what celebrating the eucharist is about it is not difficult to understand why the mass as the means by which the death and resurrection of jesus reaches into and influences our lives must have a central place in catholic christian life saint aimard spoke in very moving language of the eucharist as the sacrament by which the saving death of jesus reaches into and influences our lives this can be seen in a small sampling of his thought the holy sacrifice of the mass is the representation of the sacrifice of the cross jesus discovered the means of giving himself as victim in an ongoing way even in his state of glory holy mass is the most glorious act that can be offered to god the holiest and the most salutary for us the eucharist represents recalls the death of our lord as the supreme and final act of love it is nothing other than love bursting forth from the cenacle aimard's profound appreciation of the mass was a constant in his life and the first signs of that appreciation manifested themselves even in his childhood peter julian had to wait till he was 12 years old before he could make his first communion but when he was several years younger there was nothing to prevent him from serving mass and we are told that he did so frequently and with great care piety and joy there is much to ponder with praise and gratitude in the fact that the celebration of the eucharist extends the death and resurrection of jesus into our own time and place through the mass we are constantly reconnected with jesus our saving sacrificial victim and our lord jesus through the gift of the eucharist the eucharist as liturgical celebration and as reserved sacrament we are able to live constantly in the presence of god the father through the presence of the son and in their holy spirit such a gift try as we might to say something especially significant about it is ultimately beyond words sacrament of the church growth and unity the reason for the eucharistic sacrament is the love of jesus for his church jesus wishes to stay on earth with his church and for his church so as to be her life her power and her glory those words from the pen of saint peter julian aimard echo a reality 
that the church has constantly recognized through the ages namely that there is a very intimate relationship between the eucharist and the church of christ let us explore a few aspects of that intimate relationship when jesus at the last supper established a new covenant in his body given in sacrifice and in his blood shed in other words when jesus instituted the eucharist he laid the foundation of a new spiritual community of people a community we call the church and when the apostles ate and drank what jesus handed to them they entered for the first time into sacramental communion with him from that moment in the upper room till the last time that a catholic congregation receives the eucharist at the end of the world the church has been built up and will continue to be built up through sacramental communion with christ by our eating and drinking of the sacramental christ our oneness with christ began in baptism is constantly renewed and consolidated in the act of receiving holy communion we can say not only that each of us receives christ but also that christ receives each of us in other words if our hearts and souls are fully open to it christ enters into an intense friendship of life and love with us in the 6th chapter of john's gospel we hear jesus promise he who eats me will live because of me john chapter 6 verse 57 but the kind of friendship we enter into with christ is not of a snug glubbish exclusive kind it does not close it upon itself rather it makes us as individual persons and as a church what the second vatican council called a sacrament for humanity that means that we are meant to be to the world around us a sign and instrument of the salvation achieved by christ we are meant to be light to the world and salt of the earth we are to share with the world around us the wisdom the joy the savior of christ gospel it's by constantly drawing our life from the eucharist and living in the eucharist that we as the church draw the spiritual power needed to carry out the mission of the church we have been describing how reception of the eucharist and living from the eucharist gather the church into intimate friendship with christ and energize her for the accomplishment of her mission it would be helpful here to say a few words about how our devout reception of communion confirms us as the church of christ in the unity that is ours as the mystical body of christ in his first letter to the corinthians st paul refers to the unifying power that is present in our worthy participation in the eucharist in a passage that we have heard many times over but that we cannot hear too may often st paul says the bread which we break is it not a communion in the body of christ because there is one bread we who are many are one body for we all partake of the one bread 1 corinthians chapter 10 verse 16 what st paul is saying here is that our union with christ in eating of the eucharist makes it possible for us very different persons that we are to share in the unity of christ's body the church our living on the eucharist reinforces incorporation into christ which we experience when we were baptized and receive the holy spirit therefore 
the eucharist calls us to a strong sense of unity among ourselves when we appreciate the eucharistic unity we are describing here it is necessarily shocking to see our fellow catholics cause our countenance disunity within catholic communities or more specifically within catholic families especially when it is in a power to bring about healing and reconciliation we all know of instances where division has developed in parishes and the church organizations and of course in families something that occurs rather more frequently it sometimes happens that a relationship between parents and children or among siblings gradually deteriorates and eventually hardens into a long enduring attitude of indifference and refusal to communicate what a counter sign to eucharistic living it is when two estranged members of a catholic family are not seeking the healing of a disturbed relationship not seeking reconciliation when the world and society are torn by terrible disunity we catholic christians must do everything in our power to foster unity in the family in the parish community in the church on the local and universal level genuine eucharistic living entails such an effort demands such an effort on our part all too briefly we have attempted to demonstrate the very intimate link between the church and the eucharist the sacrament that forms and empowers the church we began with some well chosen touching words from the pen of saint peter julian aimard we conclude with equally well chosen touching words from this apostle of the eucharist the church is powerful and fruitful through the eucharist the children of the church must be fed and read they have a seed of the divine in them this must be developed and made to grow the eucharist is the means through which the church forms jesus christ in her children the church always keeps her table laid she invites her children implores them to come and draw therefrom life and strength revelation of christ love the eucharist and saint peter julian a mod we all know that to be absolutely true and authentic our affection self giving and generosity need to be expressed in bodily form through the activity and energy of our body our love goes beyond pious wishes and becomes active in deeds and of course love attains its highest expression when we surrender our body to death when we give our life for the sake of another jesus said No one has greater love than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. John chapter 15 verse 13. In his relationship with us humans, God chose to respond this truth that governs relationships among humans. The evangelist John declared this truth in the incomparable phrase and the word became flesh. and made his dwelling among us john chapter 1 verse 14 if the word of god is to give himself to us in complete love he can only really give himself in the form of flesh and blood in the form of a human being in the word of god incarnate jesus christ what god has to say to us and do for us he says and does in bodily terms that is with this flesh and blood but the love that we humans express with our body in necessarily limited no matter how ardent and selfish our love is for another it comes up against boundaries no matter how passionate and self-giving human love is flesh cannot fuse with flesh 
in other words our human fleshy existence limits the extent of our communion with the another only the incarnate word of god jesus could take on our existence in bodily form and go beyond its boundaries with those startling and blessed words take eat this is my body drink this is my blood jesus invites us to take his true real and substantial presence into ourselves such is the radical character of divine love christ love a love that is revealed and prown in christ's eucharistic gift saint peter julian amod was exceptionally struck by this love of christ revealed and prown in the eucharist on the feast of corpus christi in the year 1845 while he was carrying the blessed sacrament in procession through the streets of lyons france he was convinced that the eucharist is the greatest possible proclamation of god's love for human kind in the eucharist can be found and accessed the passionate god of history and humanity Emmott's great discovery of the Eucharist as the great gift of love which the Father has expressed in the Son brought on a striking realization and obvious consequences if love is the way that God has saved the world in Jesus and God wishes us to appreciate this love live in this love then it is with God's love that we must travel life's path that we must rebuild the fabric of the church and of society god is love and only in love can we find the truth of our being and the meaning of our existence saint amod's understanding and appreciation of god's love revealed in the eucharist deepened more and more as the years went by and at the same time it pained him that this tremendous astounding love remain unrecognized and lacking a response by large segments of christian society also it dressed him that some devout christians failed to recognize the true dimensions of god's love whereas a recognition of those dimensions would enable them to understand their true dignity and worth as human beings and especially as members of Christ brothers and sisters of Jesus st peter julian increasingly felt the need of proclaiming to everyone the tremendous love of god revealed in jesus christ if the eucharist is the sacramental means through which we come in contact with that love and are inspired by that love then the eucharist is the place for discovering the fullness of life for ourselves and the world as well as the means of resolving the great problems of intolerance prejudice greed and selfishness in his first letter 1 john chapter 4 verse 8 st john declares succinctly and boldly God is love. God, a trinity of persons, exists eternally in loving intercommunion. And the truly wondrous thing is that in and through Jesus Christ, we are invited to enter into and be part of that community of love. And if Jesus is the proof of God's love for us, God's love for the world, the proof is given in more than words alone more than authoritative teaching alone the proof is given also in the entirety of jesus earthly life and especially in the battering of his body and the pouring out of his blood in his passion and death and the proof of god's love for us goes even further to the point of having the power of Jesus passion and death extended to us in a particular time and place through the eucharist 
Christ love reaches into our lives and impacts upon our lives our minds hearts and souls if we are completely open to it Christ love can truly flood our souls and wash away all that is egoistic and resistant to God's will then we become the channels through which God's love goodness compassion and peace are extended to the world around us what we have attempted to say here in several hundreds words was said ever so concisely and masterfully by pope benedict in his address at the 2005 world youth day in germany a holy father puts it this way in the eucharist god no longer simply stands before us as the one who is totally other he is within us and we are in him his dynamic enters into us and then seeks to spread outward to others until it fills the world so that his love can truly become dominant measure of the world christ presence among us the eucharist and saint peter julian amod in its authoritative catechism issued in 1994 the catholic church teaches christ jesus is present in many ways in his church but he is present most especially in the eucharistic species belief in the real presence of jesus in the eucharist has been a constant since the earliest days of the church we can say that this true presence of jesus is the very heart of the eucharist what's more this true presence is something that we necessarily recognize and accept in faith faith necessarily comes into play this means that what we regarded as simply bread and wine on the altar before the words of consecration we now regard after the consecration as reality filled signs of the personal presence and self bestowal of jesus christ the church faith in the real presence is beautifully expressed in a hymn composed for the feast of corpus christi a hymn entitled adoro de devote a small portion of that hymn as translated by gerard manley hopkins goes god had here in hiding whom i do adore masked by these bare shadows shape and nothing more seeing touching tasting are in the deceived how says trusty hearing that shall be believed what god's son has told me take for truth i do truth himself speaks truly or there is nothing true there is no question but that the real presence of christ in the eucharist enjoyed a great prominence in the thought teaching and life of saint peter julian amod he tirelessly emphasized the real presence of christ in the eucharist and the astounding truth of that sacramental presence namely that it communicates to us the very person of christ and this intense conviction of faith gave rise to the conscious affirmation with which he expressed that faith the holy eucharist is jesus past present and future it is jesus sacramentalized blessed is the soul that knows how to find jesus in the divine eucharist it seems that where the eucharistic presence of christ was concerned saint amod was quite a precocious child his sister marian who was 12 years older than he told the story many years after the incident of how her little 5 year old brother was missing one day 
and could not be found then she thought of looking in the parish church and sure enough that's where he was he had climbed onto the central altar and was resting his head against the tabernacle door what are you doing there and with the utter simplicity of a 5 year old he responded i am close to jesus here and listening to him no doubt it was with a similar simplicity of faith that saint peter julian gazed upon the eucharistic presence in the monstrance on that glorious day the 6th of january 1857 that was the day that abbot's tiny congregation celebrated the solemn public exposition of the blessed sacrament for the first time as much grandeur as could be managed was put into that special occasion which took place in a small chapel in a building a summer villa that at one time had belonged to the famous viscount and author francisco reni chatterbrand to celebrate the solemn mass for the occasion a missionary bishop had been invited he was bishop anastasian hatman a franciscan capuchin and the apostolic vicar of bombay the mass was celebrated at 8 am with saint peter julian in attendance there was no con celebration in those days and the subsequent exposition of the blessed sacrament lasted throughout that day aimard purposefully reserved for himself the very first hour of adoration shortly after that significant day saint peter julian wrote to a close friend what a joy for us to see jesus our king mount his throne of love for the first time to manifest his presence in this unique way my heart was too full of words to express my feelings yes indeed god wants this eucharistic work i believe we are seeing in many places both in europe and america a reappreciation of christ eucharistic presence and of that form of prayer that is a response to that presence and that is certainly a welcome development in the life of christ church when jesus gave himself under the appearances of bread and wine he evidently intended that this gift be eaten and drunk in holy communion however this does not mean that the eucharist christ sacramental presence remaining from the celebration of mass has no further function or significance within the christian spiritual life the abiding eucharistic presence of christ and the periodic focusing of our attention and prayer on that presence allow for prolonging beyond the celebration of mass the union of spirit and the intimate dialogue of love that ideally take place in the act of holy communion through his abiding eucharistic presence christ wishes to nourish us spiritually in an ongoing way he wishes to nourish us animate us beyond those brief moments of actual sacramental communion may we continually grow in an appreciation of christ eucharistic presence and of prayer before that presence may this ever deepening appreciation be the means through which christ influences our minds and hearts facilitates our progress in charity and encompasses the whole of our christian existence our call to love the eucharist and saint peter julian a mod as we said at the start of this series of reflections our intention is to explore some of the spiritual wealth that is ours in the sacrament of the eucharist 
and also to illustrate aspects of the Eucharist with the teaching and example of St. Aimard. With regard to the Eucharist, we have thus far looked at this sacrament as the gift that continually brings into our midst the sacrifice and presence of Jesus Christ, the gift that reveals Christ's tremendous love for us and that forms and empowers his church. In our remaining reflections, we should like to describe what our response to the gift of the Eucharist should be, namely a response of love, of adoration, of participation in the church's mission of service and evangelization. The Eucharist as the actual body and blood of Christ, crucified and risen, is the absolute self-giving presence of Jesus to us. By means of this sacramental giving of himself, Jesus powerfully encourages to respond with the gift of ourselves to him. How does that work out in practice? When the Eucharist truly becomes an appreciated focus in our lives, in the texture of our daily living, we are increasingly prepared to declare to Christ, Lord, here I am, here is my life, receive my gift of self, transform me, Use my life for your purposes. When the Eucharist truly becomes an appreciated focus in our lives, we necessarily take on the mind and heart of Christ. Our thoughts and affections are increasingly confirmed to those of Christ. They are increasingly directed to God and neighbor and that generates a great capacity for healing and reconciliation. At the Last Supper, Jesus gave us an astonishing commandment, Love one another as I have loved you. Because that commandment was given in a Eucharistic context, the Church has ever recognized that a wholehearted, fervent communion with the Eucharistic Christ at Mass necessarily entails an earnest embrace of Jesus' law of love. We cannot think that we enter into intimate and authentic communion with Christ if we do not accept the communion of charity with every human being, especially the needy and the suffering. The needy may be the troubled family member under our roof or the terminally ill friend in hospital, the needy may be the unemployed neighbor next door or the starving child a continent away. When we truly live from the Eucharist, we know how to express the selfless love of Christ towards all persons. The Eucharist teaches us how to break out of our tendencies towards self-preoccupation and self-centeredness and share something of ourselves with the affected and the suffering, the destitute and the powerless. The Eucharist teaches us to embrace and heal situations of what distress and pain with God's love extended through us, through our daily flesh and blood lives. In an exceptional way, St. Peter Julian Amor demonstrated how a life lived deeply and continually from the Eucharist yields the good fruit of intense compassion, charity and service towards the neighbor. St. Amor was fond of saying, The fire has a flame. By that, he meant that when one lives deeply from the Eucharist, one learns to become love, one catches and participates in the heart of Christ's charity. In his love for the materially and spiritually destitute of Paris, especially children and young adults, he had the courage to venture where other clerics and laity dare not, 
that is into the outskirts of paris where the poor and destitute lived and ate out a living saint peter julian dreamed of creating through the eucharist a christian society where the door of god's goodness is open to all persons especially the unfortunate and the wretched a society where everyone is regarded as important and of value a society where all are welcome to sit at the table of life moreover saint aimar dreamt of creating through the eucharist fervent communities and parishes where Christ new commandment of love would be experienced as a gift and a responsibility a task these would be places where acceptance and brotherhood would prevail places where a wholehearted effort would be embraced to bring to realization the vocation of love that each christian carries within himself or herself how often do we reflect on this truth that no matter what our station in life our vocation in life is a vocation of love and a vocation to love as christ loves even if only a small percentage of christians fully realized that vocation what agents of transformation those christians would be for organizations communities parishes and whole societies through the celebration of mass jesus breaks through the barriers of natural creation that is ordinary bread and wine to communicate to us the passion and fire of his love what he expects of us as his followers is that we break through the barriers of our self-centeredness our self-preoccupation to give to him and to our neighbor the love of our heart when we catholic christians truly catch the passion and fire of christ's eucharistic love and radiate it back to god and to the world around us we allow the eucharist to have its transformative and unitive impact upon the church upon society and upon the world adoration or time apart with christ the eucharist and saint peter julian aimard Perhaps it was on a torrid summer's afternoon with the disciples experiencing hunger and physical weariness that Jesus said to them come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while and as Mark's gospel tells us they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves though the gospels mention it only occasionally it was surely with some frequency that jesus invited his disciples to spend some time apart with him in quiet response and intimate conversation jesus used these special times away from the hustle and bustle of public places to provide more detailed instruction and spiritual sustenance for the disciples these were times when he could open his heart to his intimate friends and reveal the mystery of his person since the middle ages the church has quite perceptively viewed eucharistic adoration as opportunities for present day disciples to share the benefits and delights of the original disciples during their times apart with jesus today we are fond of emphasizing and with good reason that the real and abiding presence of the eucharistic christ outside the time of mass is one that flows from and leads us back to that profound communion we had with christ at mass our times of prayer before the eucharistic christ are wonderful opportunities to reflect on a love Christ love that embraced a hardened years suffering and crucifixion wonderful opportunities to lay bare our hearts to Christ and to reflect on our struggles with sin and our efforts often grinding efforts to return love 
among the saints of the 19th century who understood the great value of prolonged prayer before the eucharist peter julian aymard was second to none with exceptional insight he understood its value for the personal spiritual growth of christian and for the far reaching benefit of the church the personal example and teaching of saint aymard leave no doubt that he was a fervent man of prayer and an outstanding adorer of the eucharistic christ those who witnessed his appearance at eucharistic adoration testified to his physical quiet and his steady enraptured gaze at the host it is difficult to summarize in a few words saint aymard's teaching concerning eucharist adoration but let us attempt to sketch a few distinctive features of that teaching first of all aymard declares adoration is the glorification of the holy eucharist it is the homage that the adorer gives with the whole of his being body and soul it is adoration that is interior exterior and public secondly saint peter julian quite perceptively taught that the prayer that we offer in christ eucharistic presence ought to reflect the aspects of prayer that unfold in the holy sacrifice of the mass he states the purpose that we propose in our little society he is referring to his newly founded congregation is to give honor to our lord jesus christ in the most blessed sacrament by means of the four ends of sacrifice adoration thanksgiving reparation supplication but aymard also stressed that behind the fourfold expression of praise to the eucharistic christ whether that expression is interior or exterior there must be a present a genuine love he wrote since the holy eucharist is the blessed fruit of the love of jesus christ to bring forth love it is with love that we must adore and glorify him lastly it is important to point out that saint peter julian had no wise to straight jacket the praying christian the adorer into one restrictive method of prayer he recognized that the prayer of the fervent christian is something that develops something that is swelled and moved along by the breath of the holy spirit and so he counseled that the best way of adoring our lord is that which the holy spirit inspires and fosters in a humble and upright heart many people today even among christians look for meaning and security in what is visible tangible and immediately gratifying they look to what produces quick results this frame of mind then impacts negatively on their attitude to prayer especially mental contemplative prayer true contemplative prayer is never a flight or withdrawal from reality from the realities of daily living rather it draws our attention into reality true contemplative prayer helps us to overcome our temptations to flee our responsibilities helps us to advance in a genuine sense of faith trust hope and love in our relationship with god and if this is true for all authentic christian prayer as such it is particularly true for prayer in the presence of the eucharistic christ eucharistic adoration has been called a contemplative pause inserted between the celebration of mass and the living of christian life it is that prayerful opportunity to internalize what we have celebrated that opportunity to let christ's example of absolute love 
of the Father and of His unbounded love for us shape and transform all aspects of our life. Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. Those are words that Jesus continues to address to us, his present day disciples and what better place to rest in prayer than before the Eucharistic Christ. It is not necessary to spend a lot of time in adoration. Even 15 minutes each day or a few days a week can be something pleasing to God and of great benefit to us. Time spent with the sacramental Christ in adoration, if we truly let it engage our attention and affection, is bound to have a powerful impact on our lives. What Jesus did for his first disciples, he continues to do for us. He enlightens us, inspires us, nourishes us, strengthens us. If we purposefully and regularly dedicate some time to prayer, before the Eucharistic Christ, we cannot but leave His presence as better, more fervent Christians and spirited members of His Church as more effective signs and instruments of His Kingdom to the world around us. Our Call to Serve The Eucharist and St. Peter Julian A. Maud. In his past synodal apostolic exhortation, Sacrament of Charity, Pope Benedict said, The love that we celebrate in the sacrament is not something we can keep to ourselves. By it is very nature, it demands to be shared with all. What the world needs is God's love. It needs to encounter Christ and to believe in Him. The Eucharist is thus the source and summit not only of the Church's life, but also of her mission, an authentically Eucharistic Church is a missionary church. The power of mental association is an interesting thing. When I read those words of Pope Benedict, what the world needs is God's love, they remind me of a song that was very popular in the 1960s. It is the birth Baraka, hit, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. And here again, the power of association kicks in. When I hear that song, I think of my very first trip to England in 1967 on the ocean liner, the France. The love, sweet love song got played with some frequent over the ship's music system in public areas. Recently, I was wondering about the lyrics of that song. The fact is, I had only the vaguest recollection of them. What did the lyrics, what did the lyrics have in mind in singing the phrase of love, sweet love? After all, I thought to myself, the song was from the Flower Power, Felin Groovy, 1960s. Well, with the help of Brother Peter Harley SSS, I discovered that the song, whose lyrics were written by Hall David, came out in 1965 and was made popular by Jackie. And I was most pleasantly surprised to see that there was nothing at all objectionable in their lyrics. Even Pope Benedict could agree with this message. Yes, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some but for everyone. For Christians, this is a love that necessarily originates in God and takes shape in concern and care for the neighbor in readiness to serve the neighbor who is, of course, to be found in every human person. St. Peter Julian Amart's profound grasp of the Eucharistic readily recognized the truth that an authentically Eucharistic church is a missionary church. After many instances that we could 
side to demonstrate his practical expression of that truth i should like to focus on one in particular aimod's second foundation at 66th rue faubourg saint joachim's was proximate to a very poor area of paris this area like many other poor areas of paris at that time was populated with migrants from rural areas looking for work the situation of these people were deplorable not only materially but also spiritually many children went unbaptized and many couples simply cohabited and married civilly since parishes had only limited resources for catechetical instruction and were overwhelmed by the number of migrants religious ignorance was rampant this is the situation that saint aimod saw and experienced first hand on rue faubourg saint jacques it was a situation into which he threw himself with great apostolic zeal it was said that some poor areas of paris were so bad that even the police would not venture into them alone but for the aimod entered those areas without worry especially after he became known to the people and recognized as a friend saint peter julian addressed the material needs of these people with the scant resources at his disposal but his great concern was the spiritual needs of the people and especially the young factory workers and beggars for the aimod described the situation in these words they are badly able to work these poor children of paris are hired in factories to earn a few pennies this helps to buy a little bread for the family and to pay their rent if there are no jobs in the factory the child takes a small sack and leaves home to go scavenging the city these poor children carry the signs of want edged on their faces if only some religious spirit could be found to compensate the misery of their bodily needs but no the little workers never goes to church so as to know to love and to serve god his parents do not tell him anything about this they were raised in the same way there is nothing comparable to the poverty and the indifference of this part of paris faced with such a situation for the aimod organized an army of catechists reached out to as many children and adolescents as he could and gathered them in to give them a systematic instruction in the catholic faith and to prepare them for first communion and confirmation and baptize them if that was necessary for the aimod tackled a truly daunting task dealing with rough ill-bred and restless youngsters but he persevered in the work right up to the time of his death by that time many hundreds of young people had been evangelized and brought to the sacraments of initiation in a letter of february 1862 saint peter julian wrote to a friend our work of first communion of adults is growing every year 150 to 160 have the joy of being prepared for the for their first communion these are the poor rag pickers the poor children working in factories there is here a beautiful and attractive mission of the eucharistic wedding feast saint aimod never tired of teaching by word and example that the fruit of the truly eucharistic life is service to one's neighbor a readiness to respond to the material and spiritual needs of fellow human beings especially those most in need a truly eucharistic life necessarily stirs the mind and the heart to the reality of the world around us when we live deeply and consistently from the eucharist we grow steadily in an active love of neighbor 
the eucharist educates us to this love in an always deeper way because the eucharist celebrates christ act of sacrificial self giving for everyone it shows us what value each person has in god's eyes it enables us to grow in awareness of the dignity of each person and that in turn provides the deepest motive for our relationship with our neighbor what's more the eucharist educates us to become particularly sensitive to all human sufferings and misery to all injustice and wrong and to engage ourselves in the efforts to relieve those afflictions that affect so many people in today's world what this world needs now is love sweet love those words of a pop tune from the secular world of the 1960s correctly understand are very much in line with what pope benedict declared when he said what the world needs is god's love at the last supper jesus entrusted to his church the sacrament that makes present his love his love expressed in his self sacrifice for the salvation of the world we cannot approach the eucharistic table without embracing christ mission of love for all people as pope benedict put it missionary outreach is an essential part of the eucharistic form of the christian life the marian dimension the eucharist and saint peter julian a mod in the summer of 1968 I had the great pleasure of joining a group that was making a pilgrimage to the shrine of our lady of Walsingham in Norfolk England. I remember that our first stop at the shrine was at a lovely little medieval oratory called the Sleeper Chapel. While touring the oratory we were informed that even King Henry Eighth in his Catholic days had visited the chapel. From there, we started out for the shrine of Our Lady on foot. It is a long-standing tradition for the more fervent pilgrims to walk to the shrine barefoot. But I must confess that I was not among them. After an outdoor mass at which I concelebrated, our group toured. leisurely the ruins of the augustinian priory that once housed the image and shrine of our lady of walsingham the finely cut stones of the ruins and their dimensions were clear indications of the magnificence of this great medieval shrine dedicated to our lady in the high middle ages Walsingham was only one of numerous Marian shrines that dotted the landscape of the nations of Europe. Around the 14th century there was to be seen in some of these shrines and in other churches as well a new way of depicting our lady. She held her divine son in the traditional manner but her son held in his hand the eucharistic chalice and hose the depiction invited the beholder to reflect on mary and her relationship to the sacrament of the eucharist and that is what i should like to do in this article because an exploration of the eucharistic mystery and the witness of saint peter julian aimard would not be complete without a few words about mary and the eucharist when approaching this topic i believe there is no better place to begin than a scene drawn from chapters 1 and 2 of the acts of the apostles in that scene the evangelist luke the author of acts describes the earliest christian community he tells us that this community met in the room upstairs probably a well known and regular meeting place of christians and then luke describes 
what the community did in that upstairs room today we call it the cenacle he says that they listened to the apostles teaching as to the word of the lord they celebrated the breaking of the bread a technical term for the eucharist and they lived in true fellowship full of prayer joy praise and peace and then very interestingly luke singles out mary the mother of jesus among the women present in this apostolic community from luke's description we have good reason to see here a symbol of the blessed virgin's spiritual maternity and praying maternity within the church what does this mean we can put it this way the tiny fledgling christian community a eucharist celebrating community needed the presence of mary needed the maternal care of someone who could nourish and inspire with her steady faith and burning love and it's very significant that within catholic christianity there has been a persistent conviction that from the earliest days mary has continued her maternal care for the church mary's presence at the church eucharistic liturgy is something that the church has always taken recognition of for example every eucharistic prayer at mass speaks of mary as someone whom the church reverses and wishes to be joined to in praise of all the spiritual writers of the 19th century i believe it it was saint peter julian aimard who had the greatest insight in seeing mary's maternal role in the church in a eucharistic dimension in a directory that he wrote for the women's branch of the blessed sacrament congregation he had this to say the great mission of mary is to form jesus in us she is the mother who educates us become inspired with the spirit of mary her spirit is the same as that of jesus it is the life of mary in the cenacle which should be your inspiration and model aimar dwelt long and probingly on the idea of mary in the cenacle the place of eucharistic celebration he taught that at the level of the sacramental life of the church mary helps us to perceive the central place of the eucharist in our personal life and in the life of the church mary in the cenacle in the midst of the eucharistic celebrating church teaches us how to enter deeply in communion with her son both in the liturgy and in eucharistic adoration moreover in aimard's thinking mary is not only someone who can teach us how to enter into a deeper life of communion with jesus christ how to acquire a taste for the interior life but also someone who can reveal to us the fruitfulness the apostolic fruitfulness of a christian life that is nourished regularly by the eucharist there are very sound reasons for seeing a link between the growth and missionary vigor of the first christian community and the presence within that community of her to whom we give the title queen of the cenacle in the teachings of both pope benedict 16th and john paul 2nd we can see an affirmation of the genuine insights of peter julian aimard in his apostolic exhortation sacrament of charity our present holy father says every time we approach the body and blood of christ in the eucharistic liturgy we also turn to her who by her complete fidelity received christ's sacrifice for the whole church mary of nazareth icon of the nascent church is the model for each of us called to receive the gift that jesus makes of himself in the eucharist and several years ago 
In his encyclical on the Eucharist, Pope John Paul taught, if we wish to rediscover in all its richness the profound relationship between the Church and the Eucharist, we cannot neglect Mary, Mother and Model of the Church. Mary is a woman of the Eucharist in her whole life. The Church, which looks to Mary as a model, is also called to imitate her in her relationship with this most holy mystery. If ever you take a trip to England, it would be a spiritually enriching and unforgettable experience to join a group on pilgrimage to the shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham. And while you are touring the ruins of the Augustinian Priory, stop and be still for a few moments and transport yourself to the 15th century. What would your mind's eye see? It would, of course, see the splendid interior of the Gothic perpendicular architecture of the Priory Church. And in the north side of the church, you would see the splendid statue of a lady with the Christ child in polychromed wood. Very sadly, in the summer of 1538, the iconoclasts had their way with King Henry VIII. The statue was transported to London and burned. Near the statue of Our Lady, your mind's eye would see the altar of sacrifice with the reserved Eucharist covered in a white damask veil hanging over the altar. Dwell on that image that your mind's eye is looking at, Mary, the mother of Jesus and the Eucharist. In the Catholic view of things, there will always be a natural concrete between the two. Apostle of the Eucharist The Eucharist and St. Peter Julian Amard It was in the town of Lemur, in the very house where he was born, that St. Peter Julian Amar died on the 1st of August, 1868. He was only 57 years of age, a priest for only 34 years, and the leader of the congregation he founded for only 12 years. The final years of his life had been difficult. There were major financial difficulties departures from the congregation and negative rumors concerning his administrative abilities. Overwork and worry sapped his energy so that by late July 1868 he was worn out physically and psychically. Suffering from rheumatic gout and sciatica, he thought a treatment at a spa would provide relief and so on July 17th, he left for Vicky, but several days later, something impelled him to return to the family home in Lamur. After arriving at Lamur in generally weakened condition, he suffered a stroke that left him barely able to speak. On the morning of August 1st, he realized that he was dying and he bid adieu to his sisters. Towards noon, after he lost consciousness, the prayers for the dying were recited along with the litany of the Sacred Heart. At 2.30 p.m., as his head was being lifted slightly to adjust his pillow and he attempted a blessing with his hand, his breathing stopped and he fell back lifeless. In retrospect, we can say that Amart's cause for canonization moved rather rapidly. Forty years after his death in 1908, his cause was introduced in Rome. His beatification took place in 1925 and his canonization was celebrated on the 9th of December 1962 the day after the closing of the first session of the Second Vatican Council. When we look at all the phases of St. Peter Julian's life, we can say 
that in many respects he was a driven man despite great difficulties and sacrifices he stayed firstly pursued a eucharistic vision a vision that he believed would greatly benefit the spiritual life of the church and give glory to its lord in a letter to a friend he wrote the goal which we give ourselves in our little community is to honor our lord jesus christ in the blessed sacrament to offer to god a perpetual mission of prayer we consider the sacrament in its fullness we not only want to adore serve and love jesus in the eucharist but especially to make him known served and loved by every heart saint peter julian amart's vision of the eucharist was remarkably comprehensive for his times some would even maintain that in some respects he was ahead of his times that he anticipated the eucharistic vision of the second vatican council what does such a vision of the eucharistic encompass attempting to put it all in a nutshell we can say that for saint peter julian the eucharist is a sacrament to be celebrated and received frequently to bring to realization one's christian vocation of love a sacrament to be contemplated for the deepening of that vocation and a sacrament to enliven and sustain the christian's call to mission and service of the neighbor and so for the amart's vision of the eucharist saw the catholic christian celebrating liturgy the mass in church lingering in prayer with the sacramental christ eucharistic adoration and then moving out into the home the workplace the public square to communicate the fruit of a christ center life these aspects of eucharistic living come through beautifully in a quote from amart's writings when he says the eucharist is the life of the people it gives them a law of life that of charity of which it is the source it forges among them a common bond a christian kinship at the holy table we are all children who receive the same nourishment we form one family one same body the eucharist gives christian society the strength to practice charity towards one's neighbor jesus christ wants everyone to love his brothers and sisters i believe saint peter julian amart's life and teaching have much to do say to us in our present day efforts to live a christian life nourished on and inspired by the eucharist and that can be said even as we recognize the very different historical cultural and ecclesial context in which we live compared to peter julian's his was a life shaped and energized by the transforming power of christ's passion death and resurrection communicated through the eucharist and such should be our life his was a life that was rich in the fruit of generous and selfless service to the neighbor and such should be our life the eucharist is meant to impact powerfully on a christian life whether that life is lived in mid 19th century or the early 21st century if our catholic christian faith is taken seriously we must surely regard as a great blessing the desire and resolve to grow progressively in an appreciation and living of that faith also to be regarded as a great blessing is the conviction that we can do that best by putting our life in frequent contact with the eucharistic christ in the celebration of mass and in terms of extended prayer before the blessed sacrament in our journey of living a deeply christian and eucharistic life we shall always find in saint peter julian amart an excellent and inspiring traveling companion someone to instruct us 
guide us and encourage us every step of way st peter julian aymard apostle of the eucharist pray for us the congregation of the blessed sacrament the congregation of the blessed sacrament is a group of men whose mission is to assist the church in its efforts to form christian communities whose center of life is the eucharist it commits itself to the implementation of this mission in collaboration with lay men and women engaged in christian ministries the congregation of the blessed sacrament was founded in paris france in 1856 by a french priest saint peter julian aymard liturgical feast day is august 2nd Since that time its priests deacons brothers and sisters have spread around the globe and continue the mission initiated by Saint Peter Julian Aymard the apostle of the Eucharist like Saint Peter Julian Aymard blessed sacrament religious want the mystery of the Eucharist to be loved and lived in its fullness blessed sacrament religious believe that Christ in the Eucharist has the power to effect a radical transformation in our society and in all people the power of the eucharist motivates and strengthens them to work for the establishment of christ's kingdom on earth blessed sacrament religious share a common mission to allow the mystery of the eucharist to take hold of their lives so completely that they will live this mystery fully and proclaim its meaning through many diverse apostolates by prayer in the presence of the eucharist and an active apostolic life members of the congregation and its associates strive to make christ in the eucharist better known and loved our eucharistic evangelization ministry includes celebrating the sacraments writing teaching preaching counseling and working for justice we publish emmanuel an award winning magazine of eucharistic spirituality we promote a program of eucharistic evangelization called life in the eucharist lit ecumenical ministry hospital ministry and ministry to priests or ways the congregations members focus their energy on christ presence in the eucharist in all that they do christ in the eucharist is their inspiration and the center of their personal and community life father bernard kamir sss father bernard kamir a member of the congregation of the blessed sacrament is a native of new york city after ordination in 1966 he spent 5 years in formation work in the british sector of his congregation Since 1972 he has been assigned to the parish of St Jean Baptiste where he is parochial vicar in 1990 he became national director of the nocturnal adoration society an organization that promotes nighttime prayer in the presence of the blessed sacrament and fervent eucharistic living father kamir has written on prayer the liturgy and the eucharist principally for the publications of his province he authored living bread reflections for eucharistic prayer published by pauline books and media